Hi, and welcome to The PH, where we discuss public health matters. I'm your host, Donnell Christian. On today's show, we'll take a look at the racial and socioeconomic disparities and inequities of COVID-19 in the United States and Jamaica, respectively. But first, let's examine what these are. Take a look. For those of us who know, here's a reminder. And for those of us who are new to the topic, here are some useful terms and their definitions. The first is social determinants of health. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines it as conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. So these are like education and economic stability. Our next term is socioeconomic status. The American Psychological Association states that this is a social standing or class of an individual or group. It is often measured as a combination of education, income, and occupation. So when examined, this usually gives us insight to inequities in access to resources like healthcare. Our final word is disparity. The Cambridge Dictionary defines it as a lack of equality or similarity, especially in a way that is not fair. So when we talk about racial disparities, we mean unfair inequality. Let's focus on socioeconomic status within the context of COVID-19. A Harvard Medical School Primary Care Review article noted that there is substantial evidence to show that those with poor socioeconomic status generally die at an earlier age than people with higher socioeconomic status. Since it affects where we live, what we eat, what type of job we have, and whether we have access to health insurance and high-quality health care, it ultimately determines our health. As for the United States, research has shown that socioeconomic status is also inextricably linked to race and ethnicity. Persons of color are disproportionately represented among persons with lower income or less education. Another example is poor housing conditions, which often lead to poor sanitation and overcrowding, which further decreases the ability to physically distance. These factors increase the risk of COVID-19 transmission. Now let's get back to the show. Now let's talk to our experts. Our first guest is Associate Dean for Research and Associate Professor for Biostatistics at New York University, Dr. Melody Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Goodman. Um, the issue of racial disparity in public health outcomes has existed for centuries, right? But the COVID-19 pandemic has further exposed this um, problem. So can you just give a brief overview of racism as a social determinant of health or of another health outcome rather like asthma? So, yes, I think, you know, the American Public Health Association, with it, which is our professional association, has de declared racism as the ultimate social determinant of health. Um, but I think, you know, those of us who do population-based health work, we know that place really matters um, and the way that um, racism takes shape in American society is often by where people live. And where people live is associated with the quality of education, um, housing, food, all of the other social determinants of health that are really key. Um, so for example, for someone who has asthma, um, if you're low income, you're more likely to live in a community where there's higher levels of environmental pollutants. There's more likely to be a bus depot or a sanitation landfill, right? That is going to exacerbate your asthma. You may live in um, lower income housing where there may be mm -hmm. mold and other sort of pests that are going to aggravate your asthma. And so the way that racism sort of takes place in the United States these days is really based on where people live and how basically almost everything else in society is tied to where you live. And, and you don't have a choice when you're born, you don't have a choice in what zip code you're born in. Um, but that's a really um, significant predictor of your health outcomes in the future. Data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention showed that the cases of COVID-19 for Blacks is 2.6 times higher than that for Whites and non-Hispanics. The death rate is actually 2.1 times higher for African Americans than White and non-Hispanics. What are some of the reasons you think this racial disparity is emerging for COVID-19 in the U.S.? 
you know, you make two distinct um, points about where disparities um, for COVID-19 exist. So the first point you made is about incidents. And so those are the number of people getting um, the disease. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what we think in terms of incidents is that the reason why black and brown communities have had higher rates of incidents is that they are a disproportionate number of what we now consider essential workers. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this is partly because our definition of what an essential worker is changed due to the pandemic, right? And so now people who uh, work in supermarkets are essential workers, those who work in drugstores, um, Mm -hmm. those who deliver food are essential workers. And and for the most part, um, black and brown communities are overrepresented in these populations, people that work for transit and sanitation um, and the like, right? So so you're more likely to, to get COVID in that instance. Another instance is that minority communities tend to live in intergenerational housing you know, particularly in New York, it's really expensive to live here. So it's not uncommon for two or three generations of a family to be in one space. And so even though, you know, there's some, you know, higher SES folks in your household, you may still have someone in your house who works at a supermarket, who works at a hospital, who who works for Uber Eats or something like that, right? And so then you're still exposed because they're going out into the field and coming home um, and potentially exposing you. I think the other the other point that you bring up is really a disparity in mortality. Um, and so we're seeing that black and brown folks are dying at higher rates, right? And that's partly because one, they have higher incidence, right? So if you're more likely to get something that is deadly, um, then you would have higher rates. But also um, right. there's some evidence to suggest that, you know, being obese and having other comorbidities um, impacts, you know, mortality rates for COVID. And we know that black and brown communities have higher rates of things like obesity, like asthma, like diabetes, like hypertension, right? And so, you know, they already have um, these sort of pre, pre-existing chronic conditions that make, you know, mortality more likely in terms of COVID. And, you know, the topic of racism has, of course, been, you know, dominating the airwaves um, in recent times, um, especially in the U.S. You know, what role does racism play in the control or spread of COVID-19? Um, so, you know, there was actually a recent piece that just came out the other day written by some some other authors, and I'm not going to remember all their names, so I'm not going to say any of them. Mm-hmm. But it really mm-hmm. talked about why racism increases the risk of COVID for all of us. Um, And, you know, they really talked about the fact that, you know, this is not preordained. You know, the way our system works is the way that it was designed and set up to work. But here's the Mm -hmm. thing about inequality that people often don't think about the larger the inequality from the haves and the have nots, it limits even what the haves can potentially get, right? So societies that take care of their least fortunate Mm -hmm. tend to prosper much more than societies where there's these large inequality gaps, right? And so even in the time of COVID, I think New York City is a great sort of space for this, is that almost everyone has to use public transportation or take the train. Um, and so, you know, you may need to take the train, uh, I'll use myself as an example, even though I'm not teaching on campus, but as a faculty member, maybe I only need to go to campus one day a week and only get on the train one day a week. I would still mm-hmm. have to get on the train with everyone who works at grocery stores and transit and sanitation who get on the train every day, um, and be put at the risk of being in close proximity with folks, even though clearly I would be wearing a mask, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, New York City is a great place where you see that even though there are, you know, these large economic gaps, there are spaces we, where we are all together mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and, and COVID doesn't care about your income, right? And so just being close to people who have a higher risk of exposure puts you at a higher risk. What are some of the racially based misinformation um, that is circulating in the U.S. So, you know, why and also just why is it important to to stop spreading racially charged misinformation? So I think there's sort of two or maybe there's probably a bunch of things. So one is, I think, 
um, against Asians, particularly Asian Americans, the idea that this is um, the China virus, um, I think um, really caused some people to sort of, I, I don't really get the logic, so it's hard for me to explain, but um, have some anger or aggression to people that they felt were Chinese or looked Chinese. Um, I'm not even sure they were all necessarily of mm -hmm. Chinese descent. Um, and, and then in the beginning of COVID, there was this sense that um, African-Americans weren't going to get it um, because it really had only had high rates in China and Italy. And people were saying, oh, it's not in Africa yet. And so, um, and, and clearly that was not correct. But I think COVID really shows us how interconnected we all are as a society exactly. mm -hmm. and how what one person or what one community does affects everyone else. And I think this is the first time that our country has really had to reckon with the way that we've set up our society um, and, the, and the social structures that we've put in place or, or not put in place. We know that many studies have been done on the fundamental causes of racial disparities and inequities. But why do you think we're still grappling with this age old issue? today and how do we get to solutions? I think until those that have really benefited from the structure that we have are willing to dismantle it, it's not gonna be dismantled. It's nice to talk about it, but you know, if you're profiting off this current structure, you're not really gonna be doing the work to, to dismantle that structure. Thank you so very much for joining us um, today and thanks for sharing your thoughts and your you know, your opinions on this um, very important issue. Thanks for having me. Let's now move on to Jamaica. Our second guest is lecturer of social gerontology at the University of the West Indies, Mona, Dr. Julian McCoy Davis. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us on this very important issue. Thanks um, so we discussed. Me, You're most welcome. So we discussed earlier with Dr. Goodman, the racial disparities and also racism. Um, that it has been an age-old issue um, affecting health outcomes like COVID-19. And, you know, similarly, the socioeconomic status of individuals has actually put them at an advantage or disadvantage in both accessing health care and how they are affected by diseases. So, you know, can you just give some examples of how the socioeconomic status of Jamaicans or even Caribbean nationals, um, you know, have either increased or decreased their risk of COVID-19? All right, so one of the things that I would want to start out by saying is just to identify, um, I think it was a study by Marmoth in 2003, where he recognized the inextricable link between health and income. And so having said that, you know, it's very important for us to recognize health within the context that is not just about being in good health, that, that does not determine health, but that there are, other, some, there are some other social factors and social factors such as income, such as the neighborhood that you live in, um, the physical activity, the different things that you engage in. So one of the things, for example, to recognize is that persons with access to income um, do have different life expectancy in comparison to persons who don't. So when we look at what is happening now um, in Jamaica and the Caribbean across the world with regards to COVID-19, we are seeing that different persons are affected, but that they are affected differently. So yes, you'd have had the discourse earlier about race, but when we think about income, we recognize that persons may not have equal access to, to healthcare services and different provisions. And one of the limitations would be in terms of their income. So when we even think about Jamaica and we recognize that the cost, for example, to, to, to access a test, a COVID-19 test is all of $18,000. So for somebody from a lower socioeconomic standing, that is not an interest of theirs because with COVID-19, it has affected their income earning capacities in so many ways that they are not going to consider spending that money for testing purposes. Right. And, you know, just also explain to us, you know, the relationship between where a person lives actually also affect their socioeconomic status and the inverse relationship. So in terms of where it is that persons live, um, 
very often it is that we associate certain communities with certain classes of persons. Um, but what we see in Jamaica a lot, we tend to see that very what we consider residential areas are also surrounded by little um, groups of sometimes informal settlements, what we call squatter settlements. We also have different areas that have concentration of informal settlements. And typically in these kinds of arrangement, they don't have the necessary social amenities. They don't have access to um, electricity, water, and a number of other things. So that, for example, may limit the kind of information, for example, they are receiving regarding COVID-19. It will also affect, for example, their ability to, 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 to participate in certain basic things like hand washing, for example, may become an issue. Um, some of the protocols for COVID-19 require like regular use of sanitizer and all of that. So there are some costs that are no tagged on to this kind of illness that for some persons, it becomes a challenge when we are also operating on the stay at home orders. All right. So it means, for example, that some of them are not earning um, as they would have in the past. One of the things that we really need to look into when we talk about stay at home orders for many persons of lower socioeconomic standing, their, their kind of employment requires contact. So for example, mm -hmm. the domestic worker, the cleaner, the frontline worker, these persons have to physically go in. They cannot stay at home to clean a house. That is not theirs. And so what it means is that they are being placed um, at particular risk in comparison to persons who are of a higher socioeconomic standing. One of the things is that typically if you're of a higher socioeconomic standing, you have higher level of education, you also have access to different types of resources and assets. When we think through now um, children ha having to be at home, we're talking now about laptops, we're talking about internet access and all of that, which sometimes become a challenge for somebody of a low socioeconomic standing. Right. And I'm glad you make that correlation because um, I think it has been a recurring theme throughout both interviews in terms of there's interconnectivity between, you know, whether it's racism, you know, socioeconomic status, whether it's socioeconomic status where you live. And that's something that, you know, I wanted to really get out there that it's, it's a big picture kind of an issue. They're all interrelated. So thanks for making that point. And, you know, just a segue into the next question that I have is actually, you know, for persons who are living in overcrowded homes, you know, tenement yards, for example, in Jamaica, and, you know, in those sorts of a situation, you know, what can they do to actually help reduce their risks um, of COVID-19? A simple thing as going to bed and sleeping, that for many persons in overcrowded situation, it is done on a shift basis. So when it is, for example, that we have no introduced curfew, which means that persons have to be off the road, and you are now talking about 10, 15 persons in a two bedroom or one bedroom, it, it becomes difficult. And so um, situations like that, you know, it's really difficult to advise because where do you go when you're actually under instructions not to leave your house, you know, instructions not to leave your space? Um, I think we have to find different um, means of being creative within our families, irrespective of, of the large number of persons being together, which also, again, put person at a risk of the disease. Because if, mm -hmm. if we have, for example, eight persons in a small space and one of those persons goes out regularly for work, how do you then um, try to separate persons now when they're at home and not have that level of an engagement? So it is that families have to have this kind of understanding of each other to really mm -hmm. understand what it is that is happening on a daily basis. When it is somebody goes to work, the level of, of, of exposure that is possible, and also for persons to take personal responsibility. So if you're going to work, for example, it's really important that you maintain the protocols. Wearing the mask is important. Hana hygiene at work is important as it is at home, as well as on right. the road. So doing those basic things um, to ensure that you're protecting yourself and you're also protecting your family. Right. And I'm also glad that you make that as individuals, you also have a responsibility to, you know, take our health into our own hands. So thanks for making that um, point. 
And also, you know, can you explain, um, you know, for example, hypertension is one of the underlying conditions, um, increasing the risk of death in COVID-19 um, patients. So explain the relationship now between socioeconomic status and hypertension in particular, linking it to COVID-19. The background that I'm coming from is not that hypertension is limited to persons of a certain socioeconomic standing. But um, it would be very important to recognize that persons of a particular socioeconomic standing are vulnerable as a result of, for example, diet and access, again, access to income, access to health care. And so what you find, for example, is that somebody of a lower socioeconomic standing, they do not have the option, for example, to purchase food in bulk. They don't have the option to purchase certain types of food items that are important to their health and well-being. So we recognize, for example, that fruits and vegetables are very important, but for many, um, that is going to be the last item on the shopping list because that turns out to be the one that is more than likely more expensive. And so we're going to buy the things that are cheaper. They're going to buy the things that are um, chances are have a higher salt content and also high sugary content. So we're not just talking hypertension here. We're talking about diabetes. We're talking about a lot of other health related mm -hmm. factors that can really make a person vulnerable. And I think a lot of persons in general, whether or not you're hypertensive, this whole COVID-19 situation has got people in a little tizzy. So add that to somebody who already has a pre-existing condition of hypertension, it really can be a lot. So it would be important for them to try and control the other factors, such as your diet, your activity, and you know what it is that you do to maintain your health. A lot of persons are not taking medication because again, of stay-at-home orders. They're not able to access the doctor, for example, and they're not accessing medication. We want to encourage persons to take their medication, to try and maintain their, their, their medical appointments as best as possible. In terms of the factor of, of the inability to afford medication, I, mm -hmm. I strongly recommend accessing our social assistance programs that are available. So we right. do have our national health fund that for the most part covers our chronic condition. For old adults, there's Jamaica Drug for the Elderly program. We also have our poor relief services um, that do provide assistance in that area and a number of community and faith-based entities. So they want to, for example, engage as much as possible these kinds of institutions. Okay. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. McCoy Davis. Really appreciate the time that you've taken to speak with us. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Connect with us. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at GetThePH. Watch out for the next episode of The PH. I'm Donnell. I leave you with our inspirational quote. It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver.